clues as to where it is that I went. Stu Gatz, do you have a guess as to some place that's just a little too hoity-toity for me that I didn't want to go to? A little too hoity-toity that you didn't want to go to. Jim's not hoity-toity. <sighs> too hoity-toity. Didn't want to go to. How about this? this Chick Fil A is a good show. Why don't I tell you? Why don't I tell you this? Uh, Chick Fil A. He loves Chick Fil A. It is uh, hoity toity though. If you said to yourself, fast food restaurant, that's hoity toity. Chick-fil-A. Yeah, hold on a second, Billy. Let us guess. Um, I can is give it you food a clue. related. Okay. Mm, it is food related. Okay, hoity toity. Mm-hmm. All right, keep going. You were Holding about to give us something. Well, uh, if you need a clue, I'll give you an additional clue. Okay. But if you want to guess without a clue, I, I won't give you. I would like an additional clue. Yes. <laughs> there were five Teslas parked outside when I oh, left. Oh God! And there were two Teslas parked outside when I got there. Two when you pulled in, five when you left. I think you, you left. should just tell us. Yeah. This could take a while. No, it's food related. Five Teslas <laughs> when I left. Two when I got there. So you know, in the time. Prime one twelve. No, no, no. You know, in the time that I got there, three Teslas pulled up. So I was there enough time for three Teslas to materialize. What does a Ooh. Tesla have to do with what restaurant it would be? Well, it's a high it end. A it suggests a high end. It's not a restaurant. restaurant. I didn't say it was a Let's restaurant. Let's stay here all day until related. we figure this out. It's food related, hoity toity. Mm-hmm. Was it a food hall? It was not a food hall. Please just tell us. It was Whole Foods. I went oh to my Whole God. Foods. Oh, my God. Yes, that's where Teslas live. It's like a parking lot for Teslas. Mm-hmm. You're right. You know, I was actually, I was on the phone with someone when it happened. And I was like, oh, God, I'm going to hate going in here. There's two Teslas already. And then they were like, well, what if uh, they need to charge their cars? I'm like, you know, charge your car before you leave your house. You know what I mean? Like, well, you know, everyone can't charge their car. I'm like, then don't get a Tesla, okay? And why don't you manage your electricity on your electric car, okay? Like everyone else on Earth. You don't go to the, the to the supermarket and have someone go deliver gas to your car. So if you have to go and charge up your car, you should have done a better job of, of managing your electricity on the way there. But anyways, th- this is all to take away from the fact that I went to Whole Foods. It was delightful. Put it on the poll, Curve Billy. Ball. At Levitard Show, is Whole Foods just a parking lot for Teslas? And yes, Whole Foods is delightful. It's just, delightful. No, but it's just expensive. Very expensive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they don't sell those, soda, which is like, what are we even doing here? But I gave up soda chi- for the week. Those chicken nuggets are so good, though, man. Oh, they're so delicious. I get the unhealthiest thing you can get You get chicken nuggets at Whole Foods? At Whole Foods? I could just go to McDonald's. What right? chicken nuggets are delicious? <laughs> like, what are you even talking about? Are you going to a buffet and just grabbing like... Like a box of chicken nuggets? They are like roasted but breaded chicken nuggets that are fantastic. They are really, really good. I, Dan, I, I have a, I, I have a quick golf no, update. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. Wait. The, the, Dan, the PGA is on. We'll I mean. get to your golf update in a second, but I don't know. I felt <laughs> oh. the chicken stirring there because I'm not totally <laughs> sure you've ever been in a Whole Foods, and I don't know the chicken. I think you're lying about the delicious chicken nuggets, and you just spit like a f- couple of extra bonus details, and now you're like, I've got a golf update. Update, Dan. I don't believe you've ever been in a Whole Foods. I don't believe that you've ever eaten a Whole Foods chicken nugget. I don't believe the Whole Foods <laughs> chicken nuggets are any good. Yo, I believe this, this is what we've got now. <laughs> <laughs> of chicken screaming murder at him. Why would you lie about your chicken? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm surprised we have not talked about three things yet today because uh, there, there are a few funny ones. Uh, one, you can't make up President Bush trying to talk about, it's it's just comedy of, of the highest kind, talking about an unjust war in Ukraine and accidentally saying the word Iraq. And somehow he's just old. Yeah, but I felt no, 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 no,
like just made one up and actually said the quiet part out loud with just saying the word Iraq because he's <laughs> just it's a it's a flabbergasting funny human mistake nobody seemed more likable though after trump though right like that made george w seem so much better the perception his, of him was worse and then trump came along and it's like oh you know what not that bad i am longing for mere incompetence yes mere incompetence that's <laughs> it, it, that cloaks the racism better and the false wars better but he's gotten old and, and he can't even call he can't even cloak the false wars anymore and it's you're so like funny ah, how, he's just old it's funny how george w always is seen now with bill clinton and obama he's trying to just like look i'm with the old presidents come on like me i'm not trump <laughs> lovable They're, couple that uh him and uh, michelle obama just sharing candy oh, for no very reason i want to get into uh Eric Spolstra being forced to comment on Peppa's and the disrespect of playing it with four minutes left in a game uh, that was not yet decided. I will get to that in a second. And I will get to Nick Saban all of a sudden threatened and calling for parity because he's saying Texas A&M is buying all the players and it's unfair. Now he wants parity. It's just an, it's an amazing blind spot. Just I mean, it's, you can't say it with a straight face. That guy saying I want parity and having no, get it, no sense of humor about it. I'd be fine with Alabama being the best team every year. Wouldn't you? I mean, we are, we like are we fine know, with I it. Look, I don't want to have to learn 30 different schools. I'm fine just knowing these five are good. This is going to be a good game. If we have too many good schools, then everybody's going to have like two losses. And then you don't know if a team's really good or not. And then more shit teams are going to be getting in to these college football playoffs because they're going to be confused by two loss teams. Just give me these powerhouses with no losses, and I'm fine watching Alabama, Georgia every year. I did find this part of it interesting and, and another part of it funny. The interesting part was he took out uh, Coach Prime. It took, he took out Deion Sanders, who he does the half flat commercials with, and Deion is not happy about it, okay? The mere suggestion that Nick Saban in Alabama has never, has never paid a football player to come to Alabama is laughable and ludicrous. But you have some other coach on the stage – as Nick is saying all these things, that Texas A&M has bought all their players, that we have never spent a penny on the players, there was another coach, I don't know who it was, who was sitting next to Saban, nodding his head in agreement with everything Saban was saying just because it was Nick Saban. I don't even think he was listening. Like, Saban was saying some outlandish things, and the guy's just like, uh-huh, yep, agreeing with Saban, but not listening to what it is Saban was saying. Stugatz, he's not saying outlandish things. He is saying something I never thought I'd He see. never paid a player? Get out of here. Yeah, no, that's not the part, Stugatz. That's not the part, to me, that's interesting about any of this. To me, the interesting part of this is in 2022, he's on a stage and he's just saying out loud, I couldn't have imagined this four years ago, another school is buying all the players. Like You can, you can try to make that a normal thing, and I know it's been a secret for a long time, but I've never heard a coach other than Spurrier who was controversial and would make occasionally a free shoes university joke at FSU's expense for it to be so brazen that Saban is simply saying Texas A&M is buying all the players. But then the secondary part about that that's so funny and that everyone is seizing on because we love our hypocrisy is the blind spot of him saying now it's not fair that others can get in the game and compete against Alabama where he's had all the advantages because he's been the top of the SEC for a while. Like that, that hearing him complain about a lack of parody without realizing there hasn't been any parody because of him is funny. It's a it's a funny ego blind spot where he's saying, well, when we did it the fair way, I won all the games. But now that we're doing it the unfair way, Deion Sanders and others can get into the game by just spending a bunch of money instead of doing it the way that I did it with the earned ego of greatness. But oh, it's really... It's really funny, but why would Nick want that to change? Because the way it is right now benefits Nick Saban. It benefits Ohio State. It benefits three or four schools. So why would he want? Why would he want it to change? He likes it just the way, he, uh, just the way it is. Because once you start paying players, all of a sudden, I think he referenced Miami. Miami's now back in the game. You know, he needs a raise. 
I think, Saban. He does. Right? He'll get one. Well, yeah, because this one. isn't what he signed up for. Whenever he signed his last contract, it wasn't like, yo, everyone's going to be on the same playing field. Like, that's not th that's not what he signed up for. <laughs> he signed up for, like, I'm going to be the best. We're going to get the best players. We're not going to have competition. My job's not going to be that hard. Tear up my contract. Now his job's He's a lot harder. The NFL. Yeah, mean, <laughs> exactly. This, this is what he signed I up for. I left the yeah. NFL. Why? I left the NFL to create my own NFL between the NFL and the rest of college football. He should threaten to leave. He should threaten to leave coaching. And not just Alabama, the NCAA. It's he changed too much. To, exactly right. Stugatz, we will get as well to how overwhelming I think Golden State is because they made uh, Luka look ordinary last night uh, in that game. But from uh, from the broadcast around that game, Stugatz, I wanted to play some sound for you because it's great. When Shaq and Barkley get legitimately mad at each other, and these are yeah. two dudes who fought on the court during their careers, it's terrifying, a, a, a terrifying, enraged Shaquille O'Neal making Charles Barkley look physically small. I'm, I'm sorry, not a terrified Shaquille O'Neal, a terrifying Shaquille mm -hmm. O'Neal making Charles look small by going after him. And one of the reasons, Dugat, so we can list many, that that's the best studio show there has ever been, with Shaq or without Shaq, is because the locker room tempest of these dudes can argue and be really mad at each other on television and have it be real, not contrived, not debate television, where you're like, oh, shit, these guys are getting mad at each other, that they can still be friends while talking that way is very much the locker room, and it's very much something you don't see as an honesty in the rest of sports media because they can both handle it, right? After the segment, neither one of them is embarrassed by go bleep yourself. I was better than you were at your career, which is what Shaq always ends up going to at the end. So here's the back and forth between Shaq and Barkley as they talk about, and it's such a, it's such a funny, stupid thing whether it would have been harder to score for Jimmy Butler if the defensive player of the year had been out there. Like, they are arguing about the <laughs> dumbest goddamn thing, and both of them are getting enraged. First of all, Jimmy can get 40 if he puts his mind. Oh, he can, me, but I'm saying. No, no, but, with, with or without Marcus Smart, it, Jimmy Butler can get 40. But it's still harder to get it on no, a defensive not. play. Yes, no. it is. Yes, it is. Well, he's he at that I, level. No, no. He he's at that level now where at, at this point in the game, like D-Way said, he's saying ain't nobody stopping uh, him. They're focusing on defense. No, no. He disagree. Hey, but we all like, you don't think it's harder to score on the defensive player of the year? You don't think it's harder to score on Dennis Rodman? You said last week, hold on. You said last week, don't be bragging that you're a great player if somebody can shut you down. Marcus Smart ain't shutting Jimmy uh, Butler though. Hey, if Jimmy the, Butler want to get 40, he going to hey, get 40. Jimmy, 28. Not nah, 40. No, he no. going to get 40. If he want to get 40, he can get 40. Well, he's listen, that type of player uh, now. Well, he's, uh, we all like Jimmy Butler. But playing don't be contradicting yourself. No, no, you I'm just not contradicting yourself. You, uh, you just said don't you, call no, yourself a great no, player. No, I'm not. No, this is a totally different animal. I'm talking It's harder to score on the defensive player of the year, fool. No, it's not. Yes, it is. You better look at my finals against the Kimbe Mutombo. No, it ain't. It is not. Jimmy Butler is a great player. If you want to get 40, he can get 40. I don't want to hear that hey, defensive hey, player hey, of the year. Hey, I don't even want to hear that. Stop it out hey. of here, man. Check, no, check no, what no, I did to no. the kid. Hey, listen, right now hey, ask him. Listen, I want hey, hey, to hear all the defensive Jimmy Butler. Hey, hold on for a second. Jimmy Butler is earned my respect. Something? Go ahead and say hey, something. Listen, Petty White. We ain't talking about, about you. This is We're facts. talking about Jimmy Butler. This is Jimmy facts. Butler, okay, playing against the defensive player of the year is that a lot harder. Yes, this it is does. facts. When yes, you're a great player, like you said, you get greater. You never got greater at this point in your career. I did. I know what I'm talking about. No, you were riding on Dwayne and Corpus Coattails. I got the finals MVP. No, no, yeah, yeah, that's right. Let me point this out too. You never hey, got great. Easy I don't want to ride on other people's coattails. Call, hey, you call right, the hey, Kimber hey, Tumble. Well, I got his number 404. Yeah, oh, my boss. Oh, he's still in too. Atlanta. Yeah. Hey. Courtesy Did they get Oscar music at the end there? Like played off the stage? Amazing. Ernie was trying to end it. That is courtesy of TNT. That was Shaq, I think, his finest television moment. That's what I thought Shaq was going to be 20 years ago when they signed him. I thought he was going to be like that. Every single night, he's right. A, B, that was fantastic. That was amazing. A tremendous job by Shaq. Because when you are that great, Dan, you will put up 40 on anybody. It doesn't matter who's Wait, defending Stugatz. you. Wait, Stugatz. He's not, not right because Jimmy Butler's not Shaq. Yeah, well, well. He's simply not. No, Jimmy Butler is not Shaquille O'Neal. Statistically, he has been. It's a weird thing that's disrupting the analysis of some of this stuff. But Shaq asking others to be Shaq. Yes, Shaq can do that to Dikembe Mutombo. He's Shaq. Like, it's, right. what are you kidding me? Like, yes, Shaq wanting everyone else to be Shaq is a form of criticism that doesn't make him right. It's really hard to be Shaq. Why? Because he's Shaq.
I know, but Dan, what he's saying is Jimmy Butler has arrived at a place. It was not the case years ago, but today he has arrived at a place where it does not matter who defends him. He is going to put Stugatz. up 35 Stugatz. Stugatz. points. But Sugats, what would be easier? What would be easier, with Marcus Smart in the lineup or without Marcus with, Smart with in the lineup? Pritchard. That's all, game that's all Barkley's saying. With Marcus the, Smart defending you or with Pritchard defending you? First off, the game would be more difficult for the Heat to win if Marcus Smart was on the court. We don't know if Marcus Smart guards Jimmy Butler the entire time, okay? But Jimmy Butler is still going to get his. At this point, Jimmy Butler, I'm convinced. Dan, you continue to be surprised no, every Stugatz. morning you wake up Stugatz. and Butler has 35 to 40 points. Stugatz. Because tomorrow morning, you're going to be surprised again. Stugatz. I don't want to argue about the stupidity of what they're arguing about because <laughs> it's it. not surprising to me that you would take the other side on it would be harder if the defensive player of the year is out there. It's <laughs> only Charles saying the most obvious thing to Shaq and Shaq disagreeing for no good reason. It's not surprising <laughs> to me at all that you would side with Shaq on Shaq's analysis, which is always to every player, be more like Shaq. And you're right. Jimmy Butler is not Shaq. You know what he's been this postseason? Michael Jordan. <laughs> How about okay. that? Okay. <laughs> All right. And so we can go back and forth if you like about whether it would be harder for Jimmy Butler to get 40 on the defensive player of the year than it is with occasionally Pritchard guarding him. Fine. We can, if you want to argue that, we can at another time. I'd prefer not to do that right now. I'd okay. simply like to listen. To, this is Shaq enraged at the end and saying the thing that the, the hammer that hardly anyone can drop on Barkley, which is I was better than you when it got harder. Like when I he is dropping at the end of this argument, he's so pissed off that he's just telling Charles to his face on television after a whole conversation about hierarchy and bus drivers. He's he's getting so pissed off at the end that he's saying, Charles, sit down. You weren't as good as I was at basketball. You couldn't get better when Dikembe Mutombo was guarding you. He's saying, which is absurd, but he's saying, look at what I did to Dikembe Mutombo when I made the defensive player of the year look like something that was flossing my ass crack. Like, yes, he can say that because he's 100 pounds heavier than everyone else. <laughs> and so look at how enraged he gets at even Barkley, who's got a thicker skin than he does. First of all, Jimmy can get 40 if he puts his mind. Oh, he can, me, but I'm saying. No, no, with, with or without Marcus it, it, Smart, Jimmy Butler can get 40. But it's still points. harder to get it on no, the defensive not. play. Yes, no. it is. Yes, it is. But he's, he at that level. No, no. he's at that level now where at, at this point in the game, like D-Way said, he's saying ain't nobody stopping uh, him. They're focused on defense. No, no. He's got to disagree. Hey, but we don't like Jimmy Butler. You don't think it's harder to score on the defensive player of the year? You don't think it's harder to score on Dennis Rodman? You said last week. Hold on. You said last week. Don't be bragging that you're a great player if somebody can shut you down. Marcus Smart ain't shutting Jimmy uh, Butler though. Hey, if Jimmy the, Butler want to get forty, he gonna hey, get forty. Twenty eight, not forty. No, he no. gonna get forty. If he want to get forty, he can get forty. Well, he's listen, that type of player uh, now. Well, he's uh, we all like Jimmy Butler, but playing don't against be contradicting yourself. No, 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 you I'm just, not said, you uh, you just said don't you, call no, yourself a great no, player. No, I'm not. No, this is a totally down. different animal. I'm top. It's harder scoring the defensive player of the year, fool. No, it's not. Yes, it is. You better look at my finals against Dikembe Mutombo. No, it ain't. It is not. Jimmy Butler is a great player. If you want to get forty, he can get forty. I don't want to hear that hey, defensive hey, player. Hey, listen, hey, I don't even want to listen. Hear that. Get out of hey. here, man. Check, no, no, check no, what no, I did no. to Let the kid that hey, Call listen, him right now hey, and ask him. Listen, I don't want to hear all that defensive listen, player. Let, Hey, Jimmy listen, Butler. Hold on for a second. Jimmy Hold Butler is on my respect. Something? Go ahead and say hey, something. Listen, Petty White. We ain't it talking about, about you. This is We're facts. talking about Jimmy Butler. This is Jimmy facts. Butler, okay, playing against the defensive player of the year is that a lot harder. Nothing. to play. Yes, this it is does. Facts. When, when yes, you're a great player, like you no, said, no, you, no, you no. get greater. Hey, you never got greater at this point in your career. I did. I know what I'm talking about. No, you were riding on Dwayne and Kobe's coattails. I got the finals MVP. Me. Yeah, that's right. Let me point this out, too. You never got greater. It was easy to ride on other people's coattails. Hey, you were Hey, 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 I got his number 404. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Still in Atlanta. Yeah. Wait, you were riding Wade and Kobe's coattails as a retort, uh, Stugatz. As <laughs> I saw, I saw a great old interview the other day. I don't, I'd never seen this before, where Shaq is talking to Kobe, and you would have loved this, Stugatz. You would have just eaten this up. Shaq is sitting down across from Kobe. Shaq, who's you know physically the most dominant player in the history of that sport, just bigger, stronger, faster than everybody is saying to Kobe's face, after a war in which Shaq danced on a nightclub because Kobe was saying he was fat and didn't care enough, and Shaq retorted with, hey, Kobe, tell me how my ass tastes. 
Shaquille O'Neal is sitting across from Kobe, and he says, I've only got four, and you've got five, and I'm going to have to live with that for the rest of my life. And Kobe laughs in his face and says, you don't know how much joy that brings me. <laughs> because he won the fifth one without him. He won the yeah. fifth one, even though he went six for 24 in game seven and Ron Artest bailed him out. He won the fifth one without him. And he just laughed in Shaq's face. You were the biggest, strongest, fastest ever, but I won more than you. And Shaq's only retort was, I was thinking about signing a 10-day with Golden State. That's so funny. That I was thinking, that is so great. I was thinking just so that I could so that I could get as many championships as you. And at the end of that argument, Shaq is dropping on Barkley the the I got better later in my career. You didn't. And one of my favorite parts of that clip is just in the middle of it as it's escalating for no good reason. Miami being Miami, the crowd just starts inciting and yelling and no good reason. Just like, oh, this is escalating. Let's be Miami behind them and just make a lot of noise. I expected Billy's head to pop out of there, just <laughs> screaming and yelling, trying to incite lighting, like running by there or through there with a tiki torch in order to make it go uh, climb higher. This uh, this happened in Golden State, so that's a little bit of a fine, but it's okay. Dan, the NBA playoffs are happening, and I'll tell you why I know the NBA playoffs are happening right now. It's because we're getting to the point where Chris Cody's getting mad at what's happening on TV yeah. to the point that in that segment, he took a picture of the TV with his phone. Yeah. And I believe it's because they did a, like a round table of who's going to win tonight, Celtics or Heat. Mm -hmm. And everyone picked the Celtics, yep. and he was just getting pissed. Vince Carter, Amari Stoudemire, Ryan Smith, you're on my list. Wow. You made Get up, list. crew. I mean, not another show where we talk about the Miami Heat not getting enough respect, therefore, therefore balancing it out by giving them too much respect and getting them to the place of proper respect. <laughs> We're going to do that show again where, uh, of course, in a long not series. Not one, though, Dan. And they're not taking into account that this game is being played in Miami. Not one of them. But when, that the Heat but when you expect, when I believe that this is how it happens on television, and I'm stunned that we still do it this dumb way. People expect a long series, so it can't start 2-0. It's got to start 1-1. You, nope. you think it's going to be a long series, so it can't start 2-0. It can go back 2-2 and go back and forth, go back to Boston. And the games look totally different in Miami. But everyone, I, I believe most of the people think that Boston will win this series. They are the betting favorite. They've gotten down 1-0. If you think they're going to win, the way you're going to convince yourself of it is by picking them again tonight. They're great after losses. Tatum in particular is great after a loss. But, Dan, you're so right. It's funny because we still do that after we just had the Phoenix Suns and Dallas Mavericks just go 2-0, 2-2, 3-2, 3-3, But, we know, we, we, but we, we know these teams are pretty even, and we expect a long series. So when it says right. when you picked Miami minus four, and I, too, yes. because I expect a long series, would think to myself, well, Boston's going to figure something out, right? Because it's going to just happen the way it happened in Milwaukee. Where yeah. it was always the road team winning the team that because they weren't there wasn't that much of a difference between defending champion Milwaukee without Middleton and whatever Boston was and then home court decides it at the end. Um, I isn't that the way the analysis is usually done on this stuff because it can be pretty predictable. Like it wouldn't. I I've been disappointed, Stugatz, that more of the series haven't been Me like too. Milwaukee and Boston because the home team tends to play uninteresting games so often throughout the basketball playoffs. But I think, me too, same. Uh, but I think that's what a lot of people are saying, that Jason Tatum, in particular, after a loss, has been amazing. Now, we'll see if he's able to do that tonight, but I think that's why most people are picking but, the Celtics, but, just because how good he's been after a but loss. But, Stugatz, if we want to make it about only one guy when we're talking about Miami team basketball and we're talking about Boston team basketball and in the era of the super team, soon, if he gets knocked out, we will wonder, why doesn't Luka have more help? Because Stugatz, just like you saw last night when Luka went into Golden State and had one of his worst games of the playoffs, as these playoffs keep escalating and you keep facing better teams and the story gets harder, you're asking Jason Tatum tonight after a loss, Stugatz, to do something that Trey Young couldn't do after a loss, that James Harden couldn't do after a loss, that this defense does suffocating things to the lead guy on the other team that, right. that makes that guy inefficient. And so what you're requesting of Tatum, and it's a fair request, it's the kind that you make when you want people to go to great 
to go to greater when facing the very best is, okay, Tatum, I don't know how you're going to do it, but you're going to do it, right? You're going to figure out you're going to figure out how to do what Trey Young couldn't do and what James Harden couldn't do because you're better than they are, right? I believe he is better than both of those guys, but Dan, I've also seen him do it. We've actually seen him do it when he lost to Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. Oh, and but no, recently, but no, no, it's too But Dan, when he lost to Giannis, I mean, the series, the season's on the brink, and he comes back with two of the best games of the season. I mean, he was great. Agreed. That defense is not this one. You're right. Okay, totally but, fair. but no, but this is where I'm stopping you. Like, this is where I'm stopping you. And wait, Trey Young erased? Oh, wait, James Harden, we're going to go straight from Joel Embiid. Oh, I thought I'm this is as open as I've ever been. And Joel Embiid saying of James Harden, I thought we were getting Houston James Harden. Oh, no, Miami did that to him. Miami did that to Trey Young. And so this at the top, if you want to get to the championship, Jason Tatum, this is what it requires. Can you go over not just Jimmy Butler, but now here's Bam on the switch. Can you keep doing that? Or like in game one, are you going to get exhausted and have seven turnovers in the second half? Because it's fucking hard. It's hard to be it's hard to be that kind of great. We're going to see it depends on your view of Jason Tatum. If you think Jason Tatum is great the way I think he's great, Kevin Durant type great, like going to be one of the best players of all time, then yes, those players usually figure it out after a loss. Dan, he could go for 45, they still lose the game. He could have a great game and they still lose the game, but I do believe Jason Tatum is going to have a great game because I believe that he's that kind of player. I believe he's Giannis. I believe he's Steph Curry. I believe he's one of those type of players, a generational type player. And this will be a referendum on that over seven games. It will be, this is how he will either validate you, Stugatz, or yeah. you will look wrong even though you might not be wrong because even being Kevin Durant, it's hard to get past some of these things, and this is the hardest thing that he will have faced. Milwaukee was plenty hard. Defending yeah. champion hard, but was missing a player and is not as good at defense as these guys are when they start with their switching at the top of the key, and you're looking around, and it's going to be like, hey, Jalen Brown, you're going to get me those eight in the fourth quarter? Or are you going to get them for me in the first because I really need help? I'm exhausted out here. We played seven against Giannis, and now they're bringing the Trey Young and James Harden shit at me at the top of the key, and oh, shit, Jimmy Butler just stole the ball twice and is dunking because this is hard. And I like to me, that's the stuff I love. Just, yeah. it, it's, it, let's see, I don't think I have been wrong for the last few months about Jason Tatum. I right. don't think that he can make those kinds of difficult shots that he was making in that first half, Stugatz, enough times in a seven-game series to beat Miami. But he's good enough to make me doubt whether I'm right about that or not. He's that, he's that good in the first half where I'm like, holy shit, they're going the hell out of him, and he still has 20-plus, and he's making impossible shots. Dan, I happen to agree with you. Uh, again, I said he could go for 45 tonight, and there's a good chance that the Celtics still lose the game. I think the Heat are going to win this series. I don't think the Celtics are winning this series, but I still believe Jason Tatum is a generational-type player who, if not this year, eventually is going to win his championships. He is going to win them as the number one guy on the Boston Celtics. But you were right in what you were saying. He's never faced a defense like this. He is not against Milwaukee. Not against Brooklyn, not anywhere in the regular season has he faced a defense where five got five different guys could come at you and guard you. He's never faced it. So we'll see if he does it tonight. I think he'll have a great game. I just don't know if the Celtics win. I am glued into the PGA right now because our boy Max Homa <laughs> is atop the leaderboard. The homies. I mean, we are coming out full force. Max Homa minus three at the PGA. Dan, where are you going? Where'd he go? Dan. Danny. Hey, Dan. Homa. Elijah Craig. Homa challenge. Hey, minus three. And John Daly is minus one in contention. Uh, how about that? <laughs> John Daly, who we last saw at a Hooters in Augusta signing autographs. Dan. That's Danny. good. That's good. We'll end there. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. <laughs> <laughs> that was part that, that, one of our two. That we last saw at Augusta at a Hooters. <laughs> that was great. And his kid this getting... This is exciting. Alan is touring the country right now. He's got a great book. Literally. Uh, the the, the rip-roaring Stugatz. You're here for any auto, any biography of any sort. It's the only way to get you to read that starts with rip-roaring. The rip-roaring 
and unauthorized, and the unauthorized is parenthetical and in an exclamation point in it, biography of golf's most colorful superstar. It's available now. Uh, Alan has been doing excellent work as a sports journalist, author, associate member of the Fire Pit Collective, contributor to Golf Digest. He's written for Sports Illustrated. He's a longtime golf journalist who is exceptional at his craft. Alan, thank you for being on with us. Uh, we will continue as soon as we get video going. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, it's, this is a uh, this is legendary company. I'm, I'm flattered. Well, I appreciate that. That's very nice of you to say. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> did the bus just stop? Like, what happened there? Yeah, uh, red light. It's it's been one oh. hell of a day. So, I, uh, well, we're we're rolling. I got I got pretty good coverage here. So. All that right. video looks good. You guys well, look good. Well, let's do it. Alan Shipnock, for those of you who do not know, has been covering golf well for a long time, and it's a pretty closed world. So let's start here, Alan, and thank you for joining us. How did this all come to be? And Phil Mickelson, uh, not going to be happy, obviously, isn't happy with some of the things that were in the book. Yeah, I described the PGA Tour as high school with money. It's a very insular, cloistered world, and if, if you're the NFL writer for, say, Sports Illustrated, you might not see the same team twice until the playoffs. But in golf, it's the same dudes over and over and over every week. And so there is a, an intimacy there uh, with, with the reporters and the athletes as, that's pretty unusual in, in all of sports. And, you know, this book was really three decades in the making. My, my first season covering the PJ Tour was 1994, and that was, that was Phil's second full year out there. So I've been tracking him this whole time. And... Uh, he's obviously an exceptionally charismatic golfer, and so it's just fun to go watch him play. But uh, he, he's also such a compelling figure. You know, it's, it's fun to be around Phil. He's a live wire. He's got a very sharp needle. He's uh, he's very smart. Probably not as smart as he thinks, but he has an opinion on everything. And more than any modern golf superstar, he's courted the media. You know, I, he saw us as helpful to building his brand. So he. He's charmed us, he's threatened us, he's bullied us, he's cajoled us, and I've been on the receiving end of all that. So it's been it's been a long journey. We, Phil and I have had our ups and downs interpersonally, and uh, you know, my goal in this book was just to capture the multitudes that live within him, because he's a very complex, contradictory character. And, uh, I just wanted to write a fair, kind of balanced look at, at who this guy really is. Do hit the unmute button on your Zoom. Sorry. Alan, I want to hear about all that, but I am wondering here, when you started the book, when you started this project, what did you think it was going to be, and what did it turn out to be? Well, I, I knew it was going to be a fun, lively, anecdotal tale. Like I got, I didn't want to write a boring, ponderous biography that, that kind of recreated everything Phil's ever done. I, I wanted to kind of breeze from fun anecdote to fun anecdote. It, I think I accomplished that. I, I assume there would be some juicy bits because Bill has had this big controversial life and there's a lot of mysteries there. What really happened in his bust up with Bones, for instance, you know, his longtime caddy, Jim McKay, they, they put out these chummy his and her press releases when they broke up after 25 years. But I observed them at tournaments and there was an awkwardness and a distance there that told me there was, there was a lot more to that story. And so I, I wanted to tunnel into that. And what really happened between, you know, Phil and Billy Walters, this legendary Vegas gambler. They got mixed up in an insider trading case. Billy went to jail. Phil skated. Like, what really happened there? And what is the nature of that relationship? And how deep do Phil's gambling debts really go? Like, it's always been part of his brand. You know, we know he likes to take chances on the golf course. He's been very public about some of his sports betting. Um, when he's won, you know, he cashed that that Super Bowl ticket for half a million dollars when the Ravens won back in 02. But, um, there's more to it than that, I assumed. And so that was the challenge. I didn't know if I was going to get to the bottom of any of these things, but in the end I did on all of it. And so the, the book is fun and breezy, but then there's, there's some, some kind of heavy duty reporting that went into it to really tell you who Phil is, how has he lived his life and, and how does this, you know, bring him to this current moment, this Saudi seduction that has led to his exile. You know, a lot of it's wrapped up in the money, and that's at the root of his relationship with the bust up with Bones, the complications of Billy Walters, uh, the gambling, all of it. So these are, it feels a, quite a puzzle and a mystery. And these, these were all important pieces 
in, in trying to get this total picture of who he is. Tell us what you can about the money problems, the competition problem, the gambling, the gambling problem. Yeah. So when, when this case exploded with Billy Walters and, you know, Phil was ultimately not charged any crimes. He was, he was named as a relief defendant, which means you're kind of adjacent to what happened, but you may not have had full knowledge, but you still benefited from this tainted information. So we had to give back a million dollars to the government of so-called ill gotten gains, which is my favorite term. And, um, but uh, it, it is part of this process. He was subject to this forensic audit of his finances by the federal government. And someone with direct access to those documents filled in some of the, a snapshot of Phil's gambling. Because in those four years that were scrutinized, he claimed $40 million in losses. And that's a big number. I mean, Phil Mickelson back then was probably making 40 to $50 million a year, including endorsements. But once you pay your federal and your California taxes. And we know Phil loved to bitch about his California taxes. And you've got the jet and you've got the pilots and all the other trappings of this huge life. How much is really left over? It, it's maybe 15, maybe it's 14, maybe it's 12. And if you're losing 10 of that in your peak earning years, you're, you're barely breaking even. It, it makes you wonder how deep do these, these losses go because we only know what, what we know. There's, there's anecdotally, there's a lot more out there. So this brings us to this, you know, why is, you can say, well, that's his private life. He can, it's his money. He can do whatever he wants with it. And, and I, I agree with that, but it brings us to this current moment where why was Phil chasing the Saudi money so hard? No one ever really understood that. But w when you know the depth of the gambling losses, it makes you wonder, is there a little more necessity there than, than we could have imagined? Alan, did Phil challenge you to a fight uh, after a tournament under a grandstand? Is that the way the book starts? I'm sorry, you broke up there just, just for a sec. Did Phil challenge me on what? Did Phil challenge you to a fight after a tournament underneath a grandstand? Is that how the book starts? Yeah. Yeah, so Phil and I have had our ups and downs interpersonally, to say the least. And that was back in 99. That was kind of the dawn of, of the internet age. And uh, I was writing this reader mailbag, and, and Phil was the subject of, you know, much fascination and, and more than a little scorn. You know, that was in the period when Tiger Woods had, had reshaped the game and his image and Phil couldn't win the big one and compared to Tiger's, you know, maniacal work ethic and, you know, Tiger's upper body looked like a martini glass. He was re reshaping how golfers are supposed to look. And Phil was kind of this doughy character. He didn't look like he was trying as hard. And, um, and so some of this seeped into the mailbag. It was usually the reader's words, not my own, but I think Phil kind of conflated that and thought I was the one who was taking shots at him. And, and so, yeah. And as I said at the beginning, you know, there's, there's always been this, this intimacy between the golf press and, and, the players and there's been a chumminess and it goes back to Grantland Rice riding the trains with Bobby Jones when they invented Augusta National together. And so if you're a New York Yankee and you strike out with the bases loaded in the bottom of the ninth inning, you know, you're going to get killed in the newspaper the next day. That's just part of the deal. But the golfers have always been treated with kid gloves and there's always been this, this, this tone in the golf press. It's very mild. And I guess I had a slightly different voice and, and Phil wasn't having it. So, yeah, he, he got in my face and he said, just throw the first punch, which I declined to do because this was Sunday of a major championship. And I had to write a cover story about Tiger that night. But, um, you know, over the ensuing two decades, we, we, we patched up our relationship. And I've been to Phil's home. We've dined together. When he won the, the Open at Muirfield in 2013, I was drinking champagne with him and Amy at the party afterwards. And so... I'm, he's a real shapeshifter, and I've glimpsed him in many different settings. And I think I bring that intimacy to this book and, and trying to understand this fundamental riddle. Who is Phil Mickelson? And I've seen all sides of him, including when he's in my face begging me to throw the first punch at Medina in 1999. Who wins that fight, though? Like, my money's on you. I'm wondering who wins that fight. I mean, I am undefeated. I got in one fist fight in fifth grade, and poor Benji Gakayan wound up with a bloody lip. And then I retired undefeated. But Phil's a big dude. I mean, he's six foot three, and even though he looks he looks a little pudgy or whatever, uh, I've seen him kickboxing in the gym. And his college buddy, you know, Rob Mangini, told me like the guy can bench press a car and he can leg press a house. Like he's 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 freakishly strong, and you know. His, flex, uh, his flexibility is off the charts. Like, you, I don't know if you've ever seen him do that overhead 
kick where he kicks a like a coke bottle off Zach Johnson's head everyone makes cup. fun of that that is not a uh, that, <laughs> is, that is not something that people look at and say Phil Mickelson will kick my ass that is something I believe that is the mark that people look at that video and say that was the decline of Phil Mickelson that right there is where it all went to shit I'm not saying he's like a threat in an MMA you know fight but they're pretty flexible for middle age the, the guy who's a threat it. is Allen who kicked the shit out of that Benji Benji That's you're right. on notice all these decades later later uh, you 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 were no challenge for Allen many years ago and you're <laughs> undefeated because Benji is a coward and a wimp and I don't care who knows it where are you Allen you're just traveling the world by bus selling your book is that what you're doing <laughs> I wish it was that glamorous no I'm in I'm in Tulsa Oklahoma for the PGA championship at Southern Hills and uh, I'm on my way to the golf course and uh, the way you know we as you guys know we had to reschedule this a couple times and so uh, I wasn't going to miss it, but I'm trapped on this bus, so here we are. No, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going... thankful that you're making the time. I know you're very busy. Uh, does Does Phil Mickelson think you betrayed him? That's an interesting question. I mean, I went to Phil three times face-to-face and asked him to do interviews for this book, and he thought about it, and ultimately he declined, which is his prerogative. Uh, I'd had so much access to Phil and his people. I didn't really need him. As I explained to Phil, I thought it would it would behoove him to – uh, to tell his side of every story and give his spin on things, but um, he chose not to do so. And a week before the book was due, was due December 1st, he called me around Thanksgiving 2021. And his previous that lawyer had tried to uh, end up as a uh, as as an, a consultant as Phil was gearing up to take on the tour for his media rights, which is utterly bizarre. I'm, I'm in the middle of writing a book about him. I can't take Phil's money. And it kind of tells you that how they're used to manipulating and co-opting the media. But um, anyway, so you know, I knew Phil wanted to talk about media rights. And I thought it was just going to be a boring conversation. But this was my only chance to get him for this book. So, of course, I said yes. He called me up and he just opened a vein. And he told me so much about his secret dealings with Saudi Arabia and everything else that has been going on. And, um, you know, I, I was surprised by his bluntness. But... I've been down this road before. Sometimes people, when you're interviewing them, they go a little farther than they mean to. And you guys have probably experienced this, that they get carried away by the sound of their own voice and by the emotion. And when, when Phil picked up the phone, did he mean to tell me everything and reveal his inner self? I, I can't speak to that. All I know is what he told me. And it's not my, my obligation as a reporter to give Phil Mickelson guardrails. He, he's not a, a jittery rookie doing his first interview. He's a master manipulator of the media. And he never opens his mouth without an agenda. And he called me up because even though he turned me down, ultimately he couldn't resist telling me how he had gained the system and that he's smarter than Jay Monahan, the PGA Tour commissioner. He's smarter than Greg Norman, you know, who's the mouthpiece for the Saudi tour. And Phil wanted me to know that he was working both sides of the street masterfully. And um, so, uh, you know, he subsequently said that those remarks were off the record, which is totally false and tells you a little bit about his character that when the when the heat came down uh you know he tried to talk his way out of it which he has a long history of doing but the fact is phil never asked to go off the record if he had i would have pushed back really hard because this is my one chance to get him for the book and um but again phil has talked his way out of many controversies in the past and he's skated on a lot of things and i think he thought he was gonna do it again but he, he wildly underestimated the the emotion around saudi arabia which did birth you know 15 of the 9 11 hijackers and Saudi Arabia did assassinate a Washington Post reporter who was a resident of the United States. And there's a lot of people, including a lot of golf fans, who think it's distasteful to get in bed with those guys. You know, Phil thought he was just being a cagey businessman. He was just engaging some hardball negotiations. But, um, you know, these are bad actors that he was dealing with. And, um, you know, for him to so callously um, brush away their atrocities as he did to me and to admit to kind of the sneakiness and secret dealings, it was kind of this double whammy. Because people have been going to Saudi Arabia, golfers have been going to Saudi Arabia and taking their money now for years. And if you, if you stick to the script, which is, I'm trying to grow the game, and I'm just an athlete, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a politician, you can kind of get away from it. You can kind of get away with it. But the reality is, uh, you know, Phil said the quiet parts out loud. And that fueled this backlash that obviously he didn't see coming. And honestly, neither did I, because I knew, I knew these were controversial statements and they'd provoke a reaction. But... It was pretty clear to people in the game that, that Phil was working both sides of the street. Um, he just was so blunt about it. That's what caught people off guard. But, uh, you know, I never imagined that he would 
you know, his comments would, would send him into this, this three month exile that doesn't have any end in sight. Is he a little crazy? <laughs> uh, maybe, you know, he's, he's, de- he's definitely clever and he's wily and he's slippery. Um, and he's, he feels like, you know, it's been said many times, he wants to be the smartest guy in the room. And that, that fed his need to tell me all these things that he told me. I don't think he's crazy. I think, I think he's lived in, in a bubble and he may not have a full grasp of, of how the real world works. And um, like when he complained about having to pay California taxes, well, we'd all love to have Phil Mickelson's tax bill because that means you're making 40 or $50 million a year. You know, like that was very tone deaf. And uh, so he doesn't always get it and he doesn't always see the bigger picture, but I, I don't think he's crazy. Can you take us through how you imagine the next few years are going to play out for him? He's at a real crossroads professionally because we're a forgiving nation, as Jack Nicholas just recently said about, about Phil. And we all know that sports fans love a comeback and they love a redemption story. And Tiger Woods put his fans and his family in the game through much worse with his scandals. And yet he's never been more beloved. So there's a road back for Phil, but if he goes all in with the Saudis after the things he said about them, after we know his innermost feelings about, about, you know, being in bed with them. And, and if he turns his back on the PGA tour, which has given him this great platform for 30 de- you know, thir- for 30 years, it's going to be very hard for golf fans to forgive him. Many of them anyway, but if, if he pledges his fealty to the tour and, and he shows a little bit of contrition and a little humility, I think he can be more popular than ever because, you know, Phil's kind of turned in this cartoon character with all this preening about his calves and the bombs and all this stuff. And if he's a little more human and a little more real, I think people would love to cheer for him again. But this next move he makes is going to really determine how he's felt about in the golf world. And I think that's why he's on the sidelines right now because he just, the ground has shifted beneath his feet and he doesn't know where he fits in in this, this, this changing landscape. And he's just trying to buy time to figure that out. He's hiding, right? That's why he's not defending his title where you are on that bus right now. Like he'd be defending his title if he wasn't hiding from these questions. Correct. I mean, the PJ tour has never been transparent about its discipline and whether Phil was suspended or he took a leave of absence is really just a matter of semantics. Like the tour put him on ice, but you know, there was, it was never going to last beyond the 90 days from his comments until the PJ championship, because he's the defending champ. He's one of the game's majors. And Phil did not break the law. Now, he, he broke some unwritten rules and he broke the player handbook that specifically says you cannot subvert the interests of the PGA Tour. But anything more than 90 days would have been excessive, I think, in the view of any observer, given uh, previous suspensions that we know about because the, the, the information is leaked out despite the tour's efforts to cover it up. So um, I think it's pretty clear that Phil was just not ready to return to public life and he's still trying to figure out what his next move is going to be. You mentioned the associations with a known and famed uh, gambler and forgive my ignorance here is it billy walters is that his name correct yeah billy walters was the first guy in vegas to really use computer analysis in his betting going back to the 1980s and he has made a legendary living as a gambler as a poker player as as a guy who can spend 36 hours playing roulette and walk out of there with three million dollars he just has a gift and a knack and he has access to the best information and the best minds. And he's claimed to have only one losing year across four decades. And because of all these things, he's been indicted numerous times. He'd always beaten the rap, which made him like this, this folk hero in Vegas. And so in certain circles, Billy, Billy Walters is a God, he's a legend. And uh, Phil wanted a relationship with Billy because he wanted to know the secret because Phil is not a very good gambler. It's pretty clear. And he loses more than he wins by all anecdotal evidence. And so, he, um, he forged this relationship with Billy, who loves golf and who was playing in PGA Tour Pro-Ams. And they basically became a partnership, you know, betting together. And that was convenient for, for Billy because he would get cut off from his own bookies because he was having too much success. Now he had access to Phil's people and Phil had access to information. It was a symbiotic relationship. And they became friends, they became golf buddies, and they became, they became essentially partners. It is being said that his book is more dangerous than your book. What are you hearing about his book? Yeah, I think that's true because I, I'm a journalist and my, I have an obligation to, to be fair to Phil and tell both sides of the story and tell a, a very balanced tale. Billy Walters went to jail 
and Phil Mickelson was mixed up in that. Billy's looking to settle scores. Like there's an element of vengeance here. And he, he has no compunction about telling both sides of the story. He wants to tell his story. And he knows where the bodies are buried in a way that, that I, I can't, even though I, I got a lot of information from people around Billy and I have a good understanding of that relationship. But um, Billy ultimately decided not to talk to me because he wanted to save it for his book. So yeah, Phil's nervous about that book and he, he probably should be. It's a heady play by Billy, I gotta be honest with you. Uh, Alan, quickly here, what's the, cra- through doing this book, what's the craziest Phil Mickelson gambling story? Um, so Tom Candiotti, big league pitcher, retires to Scottsdale. The Candyman! Yeah. Unbelievable! Plays out of Whisper Rock, which uh, is Phil's club, and so opening day of NFL season, Phil invites a bunch of buddies, including Candiotti and actually Jason Kidd, the basketball player, they, they pile into Phil's Gulfstream. They fly into Vegas in the morning before any of the first games. And he, he's got this suite pimped out with TV so they can watch all the games simultaneously, which turn of the century, that's kind of a big deal, right? Um, Phil prepares this tip sheet for all the guys, which is kind of cute. It's his thoughts on the games because he takes this stuff seriously. And they go down to the sports book, and they're not really sure of the protocol. Of who's, it fills the host. They, so they're kind of waiting for him to go first to the window. But he says to them, no, you guys go ahead because when I place my bets, it might move the line. All right, let that sink in for a minute. Um, so, so now they go upstairs and the games are playing out and it's like a frat party uh, without, with unlimited budget. They're tossing a football and they're tackling each other on the couches and all this stuff's going on. And um, now the games start and Phil sweeps the morning slate. He wins every game. And according to Candiotti, he's up over a million bucks. This is in you know three hours. And then Phil kills it in the afternoon. He only loses a game or two. So he's up, what, a million five, a million six, a million seven. But before they get in the plane to fly home, Phil says, oh, let's play some Baccarat. And he winds up giving back almost all of it. And, um, so it's just a wild story. And, you know, I'm not here to pass judgment on Phil Mickelson. It's his money. It sounds like a hell of a fun time. Like, who wouldn't want to jump in the G5 and hang out with a bunch of cool people and bet on the NFL and watch Phil live and die with every you know field goal? <laughs> oh, but um, Stu Gantz, you love the kind of game uh, yes. that Phil Mickelson is because he's the one who thinks he knows something. He's yes. one, but but he's actually he's actually kind of ignorant. It's why he loses forty million dollars in four years because he's deluded himself into thinking he has some secrets that will allow him to correctly pick games. Well, that day he did. I mean, are you kidding mm-hmm. me? He was undefeated. Morning slates, <laughs> and then he loses it all at Baccarat. <laughs> when, when, when you factor in the jet fuel and the pilots and the the suite, like he may have actually lost money, even though he killed it. Like it's, <laughs> it's just a classic Phil story, and. You know, Randall Chambly, the, the Golf Channel analyst, told me, it's a great quote that I used in the book, and it was really talking about how they play the game, but it, it speaks to something bigger than that. And he said, you know, Tiger, uh, Phil thinks he's, like, Tiger, wait, how did it go? He said, Phil thinks he's smarter than the house, and Tiger is the house. And, you know, that that really tells you something. That's why that's why Tiger won all those tournaments and Phil kicked away a bunch of them. But, uh, you know, it's, it's insightful because that was, it's not just Phil at the sports book at the Bellagio. It's Phil on the 72nd hole at Wingfoot. He's trying to win the U.S. Open. And it's like how he lived and how he played the game are inextricably linked. And so it would, to tease all that stuff out and bring it to light was really fascinating. The rip-roaring and unauthorized biography of golf's most colorful superstar is available now. As I've told you, Alan has been doing a lot of good work in this field for a long time. He is thorough as a reporter, excellent as a writer. I'm sure it's a fun ride, exhaustively researched. Thank you, Alan. We appreciate your time, sir. Thanks for having me, guys. It was great fun. And thanks for putting up with the bus ride, but I think it worked out.